In general, a system with a discrete graphics adapter has three memory types. Most, if not all, GPUs have dedicated GPU memory that's only accessible by the GPU. Often, there is some memory shared between the CPU and GPU. This can be memory on the GPU or the system memory. Some systems with integrated GPUs have only shared memory and system memory. Finally, there is the good old system memory which we all know and love. From GPU's point of view, the GPU dedicated memory which is often located close to the GPU is the fastest to access. Shared memory is sometimes just a virtual memory mapping from the system memory to GPU address space and is therefore significantly slower for the GPU. When we create a resource, it will be created in one of these regions, although I'm not sure if a resource can be created directly in the system memory. Anyway, the GPU-only resources are the fastest for GPU processing and should be preferred for any resource that's not going to be updated by the application. The CPU accessible resources are slower to process and are mostly only used for a small set of data that needs to be updated for each frame. But wait, if the GPU only resources can only be accessed by the GPU, how do we initialize them with any data to begin with? Well, we need to do it in three steps. First, we create a CPU accessible resource and write the data to it. Then we create a GPU-only resource and use a command to copy the contents of the first resource into the new one. Finally, we release the first buffer. The CPU-accessible buffer is called the upload buffer because it's used to upload data to GPU. As I mentioned, we have a command that does the copying and we need to use a command list to record that command. Remember that commands are first recorded and then executed using a command queue. We already use a command queue to execute the graphics commands, but we don't want to bother our rendering pipeline with copy commands. I also want to be able to load the assets asynchronously, and that means that we are going to use multiple threads. Let me introduce you to GPU engines. To directly quote from this documentation, most modern GPUs contain multiple independent engines that provide specialized functionality. Many have one or more dedicated copy engines and a compute engine, usually distinct from the 3D engine. Each of these engines can execute commands in parallel with each other. Dark3D12 provides fine-grained access to the 3D compute and copy engines using queues and command lists. End quote. You can check if your graphics adapter has any of those engines by running Windows Task Manager, select Performance and choose GPU. As you can see, there is a 3D engine and a copy engine on my GPU. You can also see the amount of dedicated and shared memory for graphics resources. If you open the drop down menu next to any of these graphs, you can see that there are multiple engines for each type. So the idea is to use a separate command queue with the specific task of executing copy commands. That way we don't have to execute those on the 3D queue. We also don't need to do any synchronization between 3D and copy engines, because we only use the resources when they are fully initialized and ready for use. In this video, we'll mostly be working on setting up the copy command queue and something that I call an upload context. We can use the create buffer function to upload each buffer separately, but we can also upload all of them using a single buffer resource, and that's how I am going to do it. Because we are going to use GPU addresses that point to an offset within this buffer resource, we need to make sure that each pointer's value is aligned to a multiple of 4 bytes, as required by the API's specifications. The position buffer will be aligned automatically since it has the same start address as the buffer resource. Buffer resources in D3D12 are created with 64 kilobyte alignment, which makes them also aligned to any smaller number that's a power of 2. Checking if an integer is a power of 2 is pretty simple. We know that binary numbers greater than 1 have a single bit set if they are a power of 2. The fastest way that I know of to check if an integer has a single bit set is to first subtract 1 from it and then logically end it with their original value. The approach that most people would normally take is to use dynamic arrays, also known as vectors, 
to put thresholds, LOD offsets, and the GPU IDs in, and use another vector for all geometry hierarchies. Although that's a fine approach and it's also reasonably simple to implement, it will allocate chunks of memory all over the place and that's exactly something that CPU caches aren't particularly fond of. So what I'd like to do is to allocate just one block of memory with the appropriate size for each geometry hierarchy and write this data to the allocated memory. Then we put pointers to each memory block in a free list. If you look at the binary representation of a number that's a multiple of powers of 2, we see that the least significant bits are always 0, depending on what the alignment is. For example, for any number that's a multiple of 2, only the least significant bit is always 0. Numbers that are multiples of 4 have their two least significant bits zeroed. First 3 bits for multiples of 8, and so on. We can easily recognize a pattern here. The pattern being that the number of least significant bits that are always zero is the same as the value of the power of alignment. So for a 16 byte alignment, the four least significant bits are always zero because 16 is two to the power of four. That means that we are free to use these four bits to mark an item as not being a pointer. So I'll create a fake pointer here that has its least significant bit set and then I put the GPU ID in the most significant bits. In recent years, graphics rendering is becoming more and more based on physical properties of real-world objects. Obviously, that's where the term physically-based rendering comes from. This approach is not limited to only the objects in the scene, but it can also be applied to lights and cameras. For example, we could model physical properties of a camera, such as the shutter speed, lens distortion, exposure time, and much more. Although this is an interesting topic to dive in, it's not really constructive to set up such a camera at this earliest stage of game engine development. Instead, we can take a more traditional approach of having a camera that gives us a projection matrix that depends on a small number of camera properties and the projection type. There are mainly two types of projection. The perspective projection resembles the way we see the world through our eyes, where objects look larger when they are nearby than when they are farther away. The second projection type is the orthographic projection, in which the size of objects doesn't depend on their proximity to the camera. You might think that this kind of projection is physically impossible, however, if the camera is really far away and zoomed in on a small part of the scene, the projection looks more and more orthographic. That's why this type of projection is used to render the scene from the viewpoint of the sun when rendering shadows that are caused by sunlight. Rendering shadows, however, is a topic for a later video. Let's examine the properties of each projection type. Starting with perspective projection, here we see the volume in which the scene objects are visible through the camera lens. When I move the camera around, the objects are viewed from different angles. As you can see, any object that's not within this volume, at least partially, is not visible on the screen. In particular, if an object is farther away from this plane, or is closer than this plane, it will be clipped, and not visible. These are called front and back planes, also known as the near and far planes. The ratio between the width and the height of the frostum is the aspect ratio of the camera, which is typically the same as the aspect ratio of the window to which we are rendering. The final property for perspective projection is the field of view of the camera. In most cases, it's expressed as the number of arc degrees in vertical direction. Both field of view and the aspect ratio can also be calculated from the view dimensions. For the orthographic projection, we need a rectangular volume where the front and back planes are the same size. In this case, we still need to know the camera range, given by the near-z and far-z values. However, instead of aspect ratio and field of view, we need the view width and the view height of the camera in pixels. In the next video, we are going to look at how these projections can be expressed in mathematical terms, which can be implemented in code.